Well, let me, I'm Bud Baselak, I'm the provost of the university, and I would like to welcome everybody here to the, uh, to the Constitution Day 2011. And uh, it's great to see a, a big, large crowd, and I know it's also represented by a number of schools, not just the law school, but undergraduate students from across the campus. And certainly, uh, there's an engineering faculty member here. He and I may be the only two engineering faculty here. We have to increase that attendance next year. But uh, again, just what I'd like to do is welcome everybody. Uh, I want to thank a few folks before we get started here, and in particular, David Holcomb, who was leading this effort. Let's give a round of applause for David. <laughs> and that's really, you know, that also represents the team of students up here. I won't recognize them individually who have put, performed quite a bit of work to put this together today. Also, of course, faculty advisors Jonathan Enton and Andrew Lucker. Jonathan, back here. Andrew, back here. Thank you for your work. And uh, professors. Uh, Dent and Strasser for being here, particularly Professor Strasser from coming up from Columbus and representing Capital University. You know, as a, uh, as a material scientist, I really haven't had much opportunity in my career to, uh, to study constitutional law. In fact, in the last three years as provost, I haven't had a whole lot of opportunity to study material science. But nonetheless, it, it is an important area. And although, you know, my studies are in engineering and materials, I have as a hobby studying a number of, of leaders, former leaders, who I find very interesting um, in, the, uh, in the early 90s, I spent a year on sabbatical in, at Cambridge University in England, and I really grew to really enjoy kind of walking through the bookstores looking for uh, books by Winston Churchill, either ones that he had authored or ones that were histories around Winston Churchill. So I became kind of a Winston Churchill fan during that period, and even since then, I've spent quite a bit of time learning about the history. In fact, when I was in England a few weeks ago, actually a few months ago, uh, I, I revisited his birthplace in Blenheim Palace. Have anybody who here has been at Blenheim. It's a great place if you haven't been there. And uh, almost got run over by his, uh, one of his cousins, the Duke of Marlborough, the 13th Duke of Marlborough, who was driving around in his Land Rover. And I actually said, I've seen him, you know, and I waved to him. And, uh, but it was exciting. So, but just you think of Churchill as somebody who's obviously from England as a leader, prime minister. But he also had quite a bit to say about U.S. constitutional law. In fact, there was a paper in 1936, authored a piece called What Goods a Constitution? And if you haven't read this, you can probably Google it and find it. Not while I'm talking here, others, but wait till after the, <laughs> the session. But in this article, he talks about constitutional flexibility, in part as it related to his close friend Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And in this treatise, he talks about the rigidity of the U.S. Constitution and describes that as a shield of the common man and the safeguard of freedom. And that was his thinking. And interestingly, it's a little bit similar to some of the things we're going through today. So uh, some of these issues really seem to never go away. What's interesting that he also notes, in addition to the rigidity, that this rigidity need not to create an obstacle for new programs, but that we should give new interpretation to the archaic language of our fundamental institutions, and that the judiciary, in dealing with the law, must also deal with life in the United States, and that the words of the Constitution are only true when they preserve their vital relationships to facts. And I think it, I would suggest that these words are as relevant today as they were in 1936 and really provide a great opportunity, I think, for the discourse that we're going to have today and probably the discourse that's going on around the country at other universities at their Constitution Day. So again, let me welcome you and thank you for your attendance. Good afternoon. My name is Molly McQuillan. Distinguished guests, faculty, students, and friends. The purpose of today's forum is to celebrate the 224th anniversary of our founding charter, the Constitution. It is an honor to introduce Professor Mark Strasser from Capital University Law School and Professor George Dent from Case Western Reserve University School of Law. The Constitution Day Student Committee appreciates your taking the time to discuss same-sex marriage and the Constitution. I would also like to introduce the three panelists, Mr. John Drennan, Mr. Daniel Griffith, and Ms. Aperva Kaushik, as well as the moderator, Mr. David Holcomb. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Defense of Marriage Act, passed by Congress in 1996 and known as DOMA, defines marriage as a legal union between one man and one woman. As a result, same-sex couples are barred from receiving federal benefits conferred upon married couples, 
and no state is required to recognize same-sex marriages granted by another state. On February 23, 2011, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder announced that the Obama administration had determined DOMA to be unconstitutional and that the Justice Department would no longer provide legal support for the law. Currently, same-sex marriage licenses are granted by six states, Connecticut, Iowa, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, and most recently, New York. Meanwhile, many states have adopted measures designed to forbid same-sex marriage. With polls reflecting for the first time a nation evenly divided on the issue, 2011 is proving to be a pivotal year for both advocates and opponents of same-sex marriage. Our speakers will discuss a range of constitutional issues related to federal and state regulation of same-sex marriage, including the constitutionality of DOMA. Out of respect for our speakers, we ask that you please silence your cell phones and remain respectful throughout the program. Professor Strasser, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes, and so will Professor Dent. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to participate, and I thank you for attending. Um, I'm going to discuss uh, basically the constitutionality of same-sex marriage bans generally, and maybe uh, that will to some extent apply to DOMA, and further discussion of DOMA can come up in questions. But I'm going to do the general question of whether it is permissible to preclude same-sex couples from marrying. The federal constitution offers at least two bases upon which it's argued, not always successfully, that same-sex marriage is protected. And I'm going to talk about each of those. One, one claim is that same-sex marriage falls within the right to privacy. The other is that prohibiting same-sex marriage violates equal protection guarantees. So first, let's talk about the right to privacy. The right to privacy protects various family-related interests. It protects the right to have your child, right to raise your child, procreational interests, whether you can access contraception, whether you can have an abortion. And actually, within the right to privacy, we have the right to marry recognized. Now, even when something falls within the right to privacy, that doesn't mean the state cannot regulate it. As long as the state has compelling interests and the state has narrowly tailored its classification to promote those interests, the state can regulate something even when it falls within that protected area. However, in the various cases in which same-sex marriage bans have been uh, decided by the courts. They have sometimes upheld the bans, but only under a very deferential standard. No court has been willing to uphold such a ban using the test I just described. Now, it might seem that because the right to marry is already recognized, then this is a pretty straightforward issue. But most courts, many courts analyzing the issue have said the following, well, really the right to marry is the right to marry someone of a different sex. Why? Well, some will suggest only different sex couples can have children through their union. Now, there is, of course, no constitutional or statutory requirement that married couples have kids. Now, to see why this is really not such a plausible analysis of the right to marry, let's think back to basically the first case to recognize that the right to marry was a fundamental interest, and that's Loving versus Virginia. At issue was Virginia's interracial marriage ban. 
In that opinion, the court nowhere mentions children. Now, the court did say that marriage is necessary for the survival of humankind, but didn't explain the point further. And because marriage, it is thought, helps both the adults in the relationship and the children, it may not be uh, children related. Why didn't the court mention children? Well, in this case, the state of Virginia had said the reason its marriage ban was permissible was for the sake of the children. It claimed that children born of interracial unions were somehow inferior to other children. So the court wasn't going there. The court instead was talking about the interests of the adults. Now, that's not to say the court ignores the interests of children. In the next important case involving marriage, the Blocky versus Red Hail, the court specifically talked about children. So here's what was at issue. You have an individual who fathered a child in high school with one woman. He wanted to marry someone else. Wisconsin said, if you're a non-custodial parent and you can't keep up on your support payments, we're not going to let you get married. He challenged the statute. Now, Wisconsin, of course, had legitimate interest in protecting the public treasury. But the court said the interests here are very important. Now, it's not as if the court was thinking, gosh, children are only born into marriage. One, because this man had already fathered a child. And two, because, oops, because his fiancée was pregnant. So she was going to have a child. And any interests that are promoted by having children raised in the family wouldn't be promoted by denying him the right to marry. They were going to have the child anyway. But what was at issue is whether the child would be born within the marital unit. Now, children traditionally are thought to do better in stable homes, and marriage promotes stability. But the children who benefit are not just those who are biologically related to both adults. It's children generally. And if it were really true that it was only those children related to both adults who benefit, we would be in a lot of trouble given the great number of children who are being raised by, in many cases, two adults, where at least one is not biologically related, just because we have so many blended families. Now, marriage is of vital interest to individuals, to the children they might be raising, and to society. All of those interests are promoted by recognizing same-sex marriage, not by denying it. Now, the equal protection claim, let me shift to it. Marriage bans, basically, that say a man can marry a woman, but not a man. A woman can marry a, a man, but not a woman, are classifying on the basis of sex. They're targeting, probably, orientation, but the classification is sex. Why is that important? Because under our current jurisprudence, a classification on the basis of sex has to be examined closely. The state has to have important interests. And the state classification has to be closely tailored to promote those interests. No court addressing same-sex marriage has struck down, I'm sorry, has upheld same-sex marriage ban on the basis I just spoke about. The only time it's been upheld is on the very deferential uh, basis. Now let's talk about this deferential basis. Maybe courts shouldn't examine with higher scrutiny. Well, what are the interests served by same-sex marriage bans? Well, some courts reason in this way. Well, you know, because different sex couples might have children um, just during an evening without planning, might be accidental, it's more important to get them to marry than same-sex couples, because same-sex couples, if they're going to have children, they have to plan ahead. They have to do a lot. You have to adopt. You might have to use, uh, I don't know, surrogacy or do something. It's not something that's likely to happen on the spur of the moment. But, note, precluding same-sex couples from marrying is not going to encourage different sex couples to marry earlier to stay married longer, it's not going to have an effect. So here's what's being done. The different sex couples are marrying or not, and of course we have a lower rate now, 
anyway, but the bans are imposing a burden. What burden? They're imposing on the adults, any children they might be raising, and society itself, insofar as marriage promotes particular ends. So even if we're looking just for a rational basis, some legitimate reason, marriage isn't promoting different, sorry, same-sex marriage bans, don't promote different sex marriage. All they're doing is denying individuals who want to marry to have that interest respected, denying the children who might be within those families the benefits that accrue both tangible and intangible from having their parents married. And at least as some courts have suggested, and some judges have suggested, same-sex marriage bans don't even promote legitimate state purposes. So I would argue we need a higher scrutiny, either because of due process, the right to privacy, or because of equal protection. But even if we don't get that, same-sex marriage bans do not promote legitimate interests, and so do not meet the constitutional guarantees that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Strasser. Professor Dent. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, first, what was the original meaning of the Equal Protection Clause to which Professor Strasser referred? It was part of the post-Civil War amendments intended primarily to protect the newly freed slave, to deal with cases of race, like the Loving case to which Professor Strasser also referred. Certainly there was no intention to extend legal equality to homosexuality. Well, perhaps the meaning of such broad constitutional concepts was intended to change with evolving public attitudes. But clearly there is no public consensus in favor of so-called same-sex marriage. 31 states have voted on the issue, and 31 states have voted for traditional marriage. The other right to which Professor Strasser referred is the right to privacy. Now, of course, there is no specific reference to a right to privacy in the Constitution. There are specific uh, protections that might come under the rubric of privacy, but there is no general right to privacy. The Supreme Court has created certain rights of privacy, and this has been much criticized, but at the least, what has happened is that the court has generally uh, protected interests that were generally considered to be part of the tradition of liberty, such as the right of a man and a woman to marry, as in the Loving case. That was prevented by a very unusual statute against interracial marriage. There was only a fairly small minority of the American states that had such a ban. There is no precedent for it in uh, Western civilization. Uh, and indeed, the statute wasn't even enforced. The Lovings had to jump up and down and say, hey, look, we're violating the law. And most of the, uh, sta most of the uh, uh, state uh, prosecutors said, L leave us alone. Nobody cares about that law anymore. They finally found some backwoods uh, prosecutor who was willing to prosecute them, which, of course, made them very happy because they knew it was going to happen. We should probably stop right there. Gay marriage was not an intended uh, right under the original meaning of the 14th Amendment or any other provision of the Constitution, and has not become part of our society's general understanding of rights. It could be established only if a small elite is willing to disdain the American people and to arrogate to itself the privilege to impose its own values on everyone else. But let's talk anyway about what we would like the Constitution to mean. The principle of equal protection is that like things should be treated alike. So, are male-female and same-sex relationships the same in matters that warrant the law's concern with marriage? Well, Bertrand Russell, no fan of bourgeois morality, said that it is through children alone the sexual relations become of importance to society. Otherwise, government should leave adults free to structure their own relationships. Societies have found marriage necessary 
because husbands and wives often have private interests that are not compatible with the interests of their spouses, children, or communities in general. Renowned anthropologist Bronislaw Malinowski said, the institution of marriage is primarily determined by the needs of the offspring, by the dependence of the children upon the parents. And sociologist James Q. Wilson says, marriage is the socially arranged solution for the problem of getting people to stay together and care for their children, which the mere desire for children and the sex that makes children possible does not solve. Now this does not mean that marriage is only about having children, but it does mean that the possibility of children is the reason for the government's involvement in marriage. The campaign for same-sex marriage is arbitrary, internally contradictory, and deceptive. It's arbitrary because we have several conditions to legal marriage, including that it be monogamous and non-sanguineous no close relatives. Many societies do not impose these conditions. In Saudi Arabia, for example, it's common for half-brothers and sisters to marry. We don't allow that. But at least until very recently, the restriction of marriage to opposite sex relationships was essentially universal. By the way, Professor Strasser has asked whether there is a re rational basis for traditional marriage I guess if the answer is no, then what we are saying is that every civilization in every corner of the globe that has existed until this time was irrational. Of course, when somebody runs around yelling that everyone else in the world is crazy, you know usually what the story is with that person. But it, um, so if this condition that uh, marriage be of opposite sex is an outrageous violation of individual liberty, why aren't the other conditions even more offensive? The argument for same-sex marriage is internally contradictory because it demands equality while simultaneously denying it. It charges that traditional marriage unjustifiably privileges one kind of relationship. But if that is true, the solution cannot be to extend that privilege slightly to same-sex couples, but rather to eradicate the privilege. For example, legal scholar and EEOC Heifeldblum lives in a house with four other women and two children in a non-sexual relationship. She wants the law to consider her group a family. If there is nothing special about traditional marriage, why should we privilege any kind of marriage over arrangements like Professor Feldblum's? And similarly, the campaign for same-sex marriage is deceptive because for most who support it, it is not their real goal. Gay activist Michael Warner, for example, sees the fight for recognition of same-sex marriage as an interim tactic, a transitional moment toward the eventual abolition of marriage. And as is the case with High Feldblum, the real goal is to get government out of marriage, out of the marriage business, and to have families we choose. Again, if Professor Strasser is right that there is no rational basis for traditional marriage, it's impossible for me to see what basis there can be for privileging any kind of marriage over any other kind of family we choose. Again, we're miles away now from any reasonable interpretation of the Constitution, but as a, fam as a, as a policy matter, why shouldn't we have families we choose? If, we're dealing, if we were dealing only with adults, it might make sense. But again, as Bertrand Russell noted, the law cares about marriage because of children. And children cannot fend for themselves in a world of families we choose. In different times and places, social customs, including those of marriage, have varied in infinite ways. But in every society that has survived, we find three features. First, 
each acknowledges and celebrates marriage. Second, whatever else it is about, property, clan, political alliances, it is always centrally concerned with the conceiving and raising of children. And the third, which is really only a corollary of the second, is that it is always between male and female. Now anthropologists tell us that given the infinite variety of human cultures, when we see that every society has arrived at the same solution for some particular problem, there probably is a reason for it. And the reason here is that throughout the world and throughout history, marriage and the natural family have proved the best milieu for the creation and nurturing of children. We certainly see that in our own society, where by every measure, children raised by their married biological parents do much better than other children. But we're told that same-sex couples are also raising children, so why shouldn't they be eligible for legal marriage? However, no same-sex couple creates a child. A same-sex couple can have custody of a child only through adoption. Of course, any group can have legal custody of a child if the law so permits. The law, the law is already present in the adoption proceeding. There's no reason to add marriage to the picture. One minute. <laughs> uh, what's the harm? Uh, of course, that's not the right question. Uh, the question should be, do we need this? And uh, the burden of proof should be on those who want to change uh, the traditional law. Uh, but uh, first, uh, recognition of same-sex marriage is at best an unfortunate uh, distraction. We have enough problems with the family. We don't need to add new ones. Second, as is obvious, and as many gay activists argue, gay relationships are very different. Uh, for example, gay relationships are much less troubled by adultery. Uh, that makes sense because adultery doesn't threaten to intrude other children and parents into an existing family. Uh, but so what w rules will govern uh, same-sex marriage? Uh, one size fits all, with same-sex couples expected to uh, 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 hew to the same rules uh, as traditional couples. That's what many gays fear. Or should there be separate rules? But of course, to have separate rules would simply be to acknowledge uh, the central point that the two are very different. Um, Finally, law and society use marriage to encourage responsible parenting, largely by the expressive function of law, that is in expressing social values and encouraging social norms to move in particular directions. Thank you, Professor Dent. If we could uh, okay. uh, catch up there uh, during closing our arguments, okay. perhaps. Um, we will now uh, move on to accepting questions from the student panel. Uh, both speakers will have a chance to respond to each question, and uh, we will begin with Mr. Drennan. <clears throat> Professor Dent, how do same-sex marriage laws lead religious groups, as you have written, to, quote, surrender and affirm, end quote, marriage equality? After all, in states where same-sex marriage is legal, these groups are free not to marry same-sex couples. Okay, yeah, this is an interesting question about the impact of uh, recognition of same-sex marriage on uh, freedom of religion. Um, because uh, part, of, uh, uh, part of what comes with it is the obligation of private individuals and organizations uh, to, uh, to extend to uh, same-sex couples uh, the same, uh, the same uh, rights and uh, uh, treatment that are extended to traditional married couples. Um, so e even, even if you do not believe that a same-sex relationship is a real marriage, so for example, a photographer in New Mexico uh, asked to photograph a same-sex wedding and says, no, that, uh, kind, that kind of a thing is, uh, is against my religious beliefs uh, and was uh, found uh, to have violated uh, the state's uh, civil rights law. Um, 
a uh, doctor in uh, Southern California who declined to inseminate uh, a member of a lesbian couple was found to have, uh, because of her uh, uh, religious beliefs, was found to have uh, violated uh, the uh, uh, state law. Uh, in uh, Massachusetts, Catholic Charities, which had an outstanding uh, uh, history of placing difficult to place children for adoption, uh, was forced to go out of business. Why? Because under the principles of the Catholic Church, it could not uh, treat same-sex couples uh, uh, for, as, as parents for purposes of adoption, and the state told them, uh, if you don't, um, we'll put you, well, you, you must if you are going to continue in business, and Catholic Charity says, well, we can't, so we're out of business. Now, I, I, does that answer your question? That's no. okay. As, as, the, as to the, the kinds of burdens, of course, there are many, many others, but that, that is, those are uh, samples of the kinds of burdens uh, that uh, recognition of same-sex marriage places uh, on uh, religious freedom. Uh, d does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do you have a reply, Professor Strasser? Sure. Okay. Um, many states have um, laws which protect against discrimination. So look at this example. You have a photographer who says, I don't approve of you, and this could be on a bunch of different bases, could be on orientation, could be on race, could be religion. The person says, I don't want to deal with you out, or so I won't take your picture in a store, a place of a public accommodation. We do have laws against discrimination. It's the same idea. Now, for religions in particular, a state that recognizes same-sex marriage cannot require, for example, the Catholic Church to celebrate a same-sex marriage. If it's against belief, it's against belief. That's up to the Church. But let's not confuse that with the ability to discriminate with respect to the provision of general services. And, you know, the same thing. How would you react if a doctor says to you, oh, you're of this religion, this race, I won't help you. It's not, these kinds of examples are not so much marriage related, especially because I, I believe this lesbian couple was not married. So it's not marriage, it's whether it's okay for states to have anti-discrimination laws, even when someone sincerely wants to discriminate against particular groups. And I'll admit, I think it's okay for the state to say, I'm sorry, we're not going to let you discriminate on these bases. And that's where we disagree. Thank you, Professor Strasser. Our next question, uh, Ms. Kaushik. Professors Dent and Strasser, some critics have called President Obama's enforce but do not defend policy towards DOMA a, quote, power grab disguised as academic constitutional interpretation, end quote. Is the administration's refusal to defend DOMA a principled stance or a breach of the executive branch's constitutional responsibilities? Let's start with Professor Strasser. Okay, so note what's going on. The president, uh, with respect to DOMA, uh, is DOMA being defended? Well, yes. Um, and as my understanding, I think the House has hired counsel um, to defend DOMA. Now, as to what the president should be doing, I mean, it's, it's an interesting position to be in if you're not so confident that it's constitutional. Basically, my understanding is the president has allowed it to be defended, although I'll admit, if the later question comes up, I'll tell you why I don't think it's so easily defended. But, the way this has worked, it is being defended, and we'll see how the merits go later. But it's not as if the president is preventing the law from being prevented. On the contrary, he's extended an invitation, and in fact, it's being defended. Response, Professor Dent? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's, it's a bit of a double cross because, uh, pre because uh, uh, Barack Obama did campaign uh, saying that uh, he believed that marriage was between a man and a woman, and now his uh, administration is refusing to uh, defend a statute that says just that. 
But in addition, uh, and more important perhaps, uh, the function of the Attorney General is supposed to be to defend the laws of the land. And it is extremely rare, and only in cases where of clear uh, unconstitutionality that uh, the Attorney General uh, has traditionally walked into court and said, gee, I'm sorry, we, you know, this is, this is a, a federal law, but we just cannot defend it. Uh, DOMA was overwhelmingly adopted and signed into law by, uh, uh, by President Clinton. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, idea that, uh, that uh, um, Attorney General Holder and the President Obama have just suddenly discovered that there's no possible basis to defend it uh, strikes me as, uh, as um, uh, indicating a, an abdication of their duty. Thank you, Professor. Our next question from Mr. Griffith. Professor Strasser, you maintain that the comparison between same-sex marriage and interracial marriage is valid but reject slippery slope arguments against same-sex marriage. Please explain why you believe that same-sex marriage can be compared to interracial marriage, but not to polygamous marriage. Okay, and let me explain how this works in according to our constitution. First of all, there is a clearly a difference between interracial marriage bans, same-sex marriage bans. Why? Well, when you ban a marriage on the basis of race, under our constitution, this triggers the closest kind of scrutiny. It's the toughest kind of thing to win on for the state. If you discriminate or classify on the basis of sex, that triggers close scrutiny, but not as close as uh, a statute that's based on race. So in that way, they're different, that's right. On the other hand, if what I have said, and it's the general jurisprudence, express discrimination on the basis of a classification that's protected triggers close scrutiny, then it is my contention marriage bans, whether on the basis of race or sex, will not pass muster. As a general matter, it's of course true that we limit marriages. And I suggest, well, okay, let's look at each limitation and see if the state has important or compelling interests. And so we can talk about whether they're compelling interests to prevent polygamy or incestuous relations. We have all kinds of limitations. And all I would suggest is let's look at the basis, see if there's a reason behind it, plausible reason, important reason, and then we'll will look to see whether you can uphold the ban. So um, I believe race and sex are different, but still neither classification, on my view, can pass muster. You know, in the polygamous marriages, when courts were examining those, they used strict scrutiny. They looked real closely and admittedly upheld them. All I'm suggesting is look closely at this one, then if the interests are there, then okay, I don't think the interests are there. Professor Dent. Well, first of all, you know, you know that what Professor Strasser has said is that he has no argument against polygamy. Uh, <laughs> uh, which, uh, by the way, I do. I, I think it's a, a, a rule of one to a customer. Uh, the, uh, uh, no, I mean, what happens in polygamous societies, uh, wealthy, powerful men uh, uh, get a lot of wives and other men uh, wind up with no, uh, with no wife. Uh, so I, I think it would be, uh, it would be very bad idea for us, uh, for us to have polygamy. But it is, I admit, uh, lots of societies have had it. Uh, unlike same-sex marriage, uh, for which until just a couple of years ago, there was basically no precedent whatsoever. So as, as I argued before, if you're going to uh, uh, knock one down, it seems that uh, a fortiori, all the other uh, conditions get knocked down as well. And for that matter, any 
uh, privileging of any, any kind of marriage would be knocked down as well. Uh, with respect to loving and the uh, standard of scrutiny, two points. Again, uh, well, well, a couple of points. As one is strict scrutiny is given uh, because the 14th Amendment was ad adopted largely to deal with race. Again, it was not uh, adopted to deal with, uh, with uh, issues of uh, sexual orientation. Uh, and again, number two, the law in, uh, in Loving was really by uh, terms of uh, uh, Western, uh, uh, Western uh, uh, civilization, it was really a heresy. Uh, where, where again do you see any precedent for it anywhere in, in uh, English common law, Roman law, canon law? There is none. Uh, and so loving is essentially a, uh, a decision to end the heresy and return to orthodoxy. Uh, and uh, which is, uh, would be a perfectly good way, for, uh, as far as I'm concerned, to do the uh, same-sex marriage issue. Uh, this also gets into uh, the, the question, this gives me an opportunity to take uh, two seconds to uh, um, uh, finish up my, my initial prepared remarks, which, uh, which I ran over time, and that is that um, uh, marriage, that, uh, so that the purpose of marriage is to encourage responsible parenting largely by the expressive function of law. Because societies care about family obligations, we make them part of our systems of honor. Well, recognizing same-sex marriage would diminish respect for marriage. How do we know? Again, 31 states have voted on this, and all 31 said they do not consider same-sex marriage to be the same thing. Uh, so, uh, so here again, you know, why is, uh, was there any, Loving uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, foreshadowed by decisions in several states uh, that knocked down uh, anti-miscegenation laws. Not one of those decisions prompted, a rea prompted an effort to overturn it by referendum. And there was no, no major reaction to it at the federal level either. By contrast, where state courts have held uh, uh, marriage to be unconstitutional, uh, there has been an overwhelming response. Uh, 31 states, again, have voted on it. Everyone has voted for traditional marriage. Uh, so, uh, so the two situations are just completely different. Okay, thank you. And our uh, last question from the student panel, Mr. Drennan. <clears throat> Professor Strasser and Dent, Section 2 of DOMA allows states to refuse to recognize same-sex marriages that were entered into legally in another state. However, Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution states, full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. Does Section 2 violate the full faith and credit clause? And this time we'll start with Professor Dent. Um, the the scope of the full faith and credit clause has uh, always been uh, very problematic. Uh, obviously, if every state were uh, required completely to give full faith and credit to the laws of all other states, no questions asked, uh, then any one state could impose its own law on all the other 49 states. Uh, that if one uh, state uh, decided to uh, recognize polygamy, Anyone who wanted a polygamous relationship could go to that state, get married, and then come back and say to of the other 49 states, you have to uh, recognize this marriage. Uh, marriage is one of the areas of, uh, of uh, moral uh, legislation uh, that traditionally has been thought not to be subject to the full faith and credit clause, uh, that uh, the states were allowed to set their own standards. Uh, and you can certainly see this is not like a situation where uh, there's a question of a debtor, you know, owes money in Texas and flees to Ohio, and, and Ohio says, well, no, nah, nah, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to recognize the debt. Uh, these are largely matters of domestic concern uh, within each state, uh, and uh, so if you want to be a same-sex couple and recognized as married, you can go to a state that recognizes that, but you can't insist that, uh, that other states uh, uh, afford the same recognition. Professor Strasser. Um, okay, so here's the story. The full faith and credit clause, there are a couple things. One, full faith and credit, although it says um, 
acts, records, and uh, judgments, traditionally, we treat them differently. This is from the court, not from the Constitution. The Constitution itself accords Congress some power to make exceptions and regulations under full faith and credit. That's the power that Congress used to pass DOMA. If, so it's a complicated argument as to whether Congress exceeded its power, but there is expressly given power under the Constitution. Now, traditionally, Ohio, for example, has had the right to say to Ohio domiciliaries, if you can't marry according to our law, you go to another state, marry, and come back, we can refuse to recognize that, that marriage. And that's before DOMA. I mean, that's simply how our system has worked, that the state of domicile gets to decide the validity of marriage. One tricky thing about DOMA is that it also f affects judgments because it affects dissolutions of marriage, divorce. Divorce is a judgment. That judgment is subject to full faith and credit. As a general matter, it's much more confusing how to analyze DOMA in terms of judgments, like divorce judgments, property distribution arising from. But as far as the marriage part is concerned, you didn't need DOMA. That was already the story. So this was a lot, a lot to do, but if it was really to protect a state's ability to prevent its domiciliaries from going elsewhere, the people live there and going elsewhere and coming back, they had it before DOMA, they're gonna have it after DOMA, if and when DOMA is struck down. Thank you, Professor Strasser. Uh, our speakers will now accept questions from the audience with priority given to students. Uh, we just ask that you please keep your questions brief and respectful. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. My uh, question is for Professor Dent. Um, you gave uh, a statement that you said as evidence that same-sex marriage would harm traditional marriage. Um, you said that 31 states had come to the conclusion that this would, would do so by passing legislation defining marriages between a man and a woman. Do you have any other evidence besides that 31 states think gay marriage is icky, that it would da damage <laughs> traditional marriage? I, I, I quoted for you, again, beginning, and, and I could give you many more quotes, but I started with the statement about uh, Bertrand Russell. Uh, you know, why, why does government regulate these relationships among adults at all? Uh, why didn't you say you're adults? Do what you want. Leave us out of it. And the answer is suggested by Bertrand Russell, and again, I could give you many other quotes, is because of the possible creation of children. Uh, that in, in, introduces an element uh, that makes it different. The uh, ability of a woman and a man uh, to create human life. Uh, and it is for that reason you know, it's interesting, I mentioned that no society, essentially until a couple of years ago, no society had, recommend, had, had recognized same-sex marriage. It actually really that kind of understates it. Uh, where prior to about 40 years ago do you find anyone in history arguing for same-sex marriage? Um, can it be that every human being in history was an irrational bigot? Or is it perhaps that there is something about marriage, that it has something to do with the conceiving and raising of children. And could it be that the people of these 31 states believe that that is the purpose of marriage and that we should focus on that? And uh, as to, uh, so that, that I mean, I, I, I hope that's an answer to your question. <laughs> Professor Strasser, would you like to respond? Yeah, you know, part of my point is the following, and this has gotten in the newspapers, there are different descriptions, but here's at least part of the story. A lot of individuals in lesbian and gay relationships are raising children. They've got children. They may be by one of the parties, may be biologically related, or maybe they've adopted. Here's what we're doing. We're saying marriage is for the kids. Give them a stable environment. Help them thrive. But your kids? Oh, I'm sorry. Let them do as well as they can. 
We're not going to give those benefits. What kind of benefits? Could be financial, through employer, especially if you're getting recognized family. It's going to depend on the employer because the state isn't doing it. And there are certain kinds of intangible benefits that are accorded when you're recognized as a family. If we're serious about promoting the interests of children, and that's the claim, then it seems ironic that so many families in this country who are raising children are nonetheless denied the ability to give their children the ability to thrive as well if indeed marriage serves this function. It's an unbelievable position to take if you care about children. Next question, please. Uh, have it right here. Um, Professor Dent, you talk a lot about how you think that like same-sex marriage, um, those people aren't capable of raising children. What makes you like think that? What about Think about like the kids that are in orphanages, orphan, sorry, orphanages in third world countries. Wouldn't they be better off getting raised by people who are same-sex marriage, but people that are educated and they're responsible, rather than being in those countries? Or think about the parents who are raising children, but could have um, like any kind of problems that are not raising them in a good way. Wouldn't same-sex marriage couples raise them better than some of these other marriages? Well, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I, I didn't say and I don't believe that uh, there's no situation in which a child would be uh, worse off. Uh, that, 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 that I, I never said that there should never be a child raised by a same-sex couple. What I said is uh, why connect that with marriage? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, every, every child, being raised by a same-sex couple has been deprived of at least one of its parents. Uh, and now, if this you mentioned an orphanage, you know, some uh, in some uh, poverty-stricken third-world country, yes, it may. It, it certainly is true uh, that there are children uh, who would be better off with a same-sex couple in this country. Uh, but uh, what has that to do uh, with with marriage? Um, uh, Professor uh, Strasser said that uh, we talked about the benefits of marriage uh, being extended to children being raised by same-sex couples, uh, but it, of course there's no experience with uh, same-sex marriage, so we have no way of knowing whether any benefits would uh, arise from uh, for them from recognizing same-sex marriages. Uh, our experience is with the marriage between a man and a woman. And that is our basis for saying that children are better off in the natural family. Uh, that is the best milieu. Um, will we benefit children by just giving them a label? Um, Abe Lincoln uh, asked, uh, how many legs does a dog have if you call a tail a leg? The answer is four. Uh, you can call a tail a leg, but that doesn't make it so. The dog still has only four legs. Um, will uh, calling a same-sex relationship a marriage make it so and, and, and confer benefits on the children being raised by a same-sex couple? Um, I don't know. There's no basis for believing that to be the case. Professor Strasser. Um, okay. Um, so... We do have empirical studies which are suggesting that children who are raised by same-sex couples are in fact doing very well. Um, so, I mean, and this isn't a contest of who's doing the best job, but it is to say, of course, um, that in fact uh, children are thriving. Much of the argument here, you know, for benefits, you're talking about some are very tangible, like insurance benefits, like um, the ability to speak for your child in a hospital or something like that, um, recognition of family, actually they're tort benefits, if there's a law school, what am I thinking? Um, <laughs> there are various kinds of benefits, and these are just tangible, but they're intangible ones as well, and you know, um, just as an aside, we do have some information now 
I mean, Massachusetts has recognized same-sex marriage, not for a very long time, but for several years. Marriage is still respected, so we haven't had dire difficulties. We haven't had dire difficulties in countries, in places where they're recognized. Um, still, that is just to say that whether children are adopted elsewhere or adopted in this country, or perhaps created by artificial insemination, surrogacy, there are a whole host of ways that children are coming into this world. They need and deserve both the kind of symbolic and actual benefits that marriage may afford, and at least this whole, the whole basis of the argument is that it does, so I would suggest they should be getting them too. Next question, please. Right here. Yeah. Sir, can you wait for the mic, please? We have, we're recording this, so uh, it helps yeah, us with that. I Thank you. I was wondering, this is by incorporated. Is there an implication or inference that uh, people are inferior or subhuman in, in reference to uh, uh, same-sex parenting or, uh, and also the issue of private property when you deny same-sex couples marriage in terms of uh, death and dying and uh, property rights? The issue of property rights seems to be a big issue in terms of same-sex couples, in terms of marriage, and also in terms of uh, those who are terminally ill. So it's a by question. Initially, I'll reiterate, is that uh, the implication or inference that people are subhuman or inferior uh, in terms of uh, uh, same-sex couples or homosexual couples being able to raise children or have parenting, is that inference, uh, I mean, it's, it's of concern and problematic to me. And the whole issue of that, the legal issue of denying the medical benefits or insurance and uh, uh, property rights, and that uh, there's a precedence that the parents of the uh, biological parents uh, have a right to uh, 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 abrogate uh, a relationship in terms of uh, terminally ill or property rights in terms of death. Because I've dealt with issues when my own uh, my mother died in terms of this issue around wills, property rights, houses, cars, and things of this nature. Could you elaborate on that, Delaniana? Uh, can you specify which uh, professor your question is directed uh, towards? Okay, why don't we start with Professor Strasser? Okay, um, so there are a bunch of issues, right? So one is something like the following. Um, uh, many would suggest that by denying marriage rights, there's a, a claim that's implicitly or sometimes expressly made that um, somehow marriage would be sullied so that this is viewed as a kind of stigmatizing claim. Um, and in a way, even if you're recognizing civil unions, you recognize relationship, and that's good, and affording benefits, and that's good, but there is a question as to what kinds of messages are being sent that might be stigmatizing. With respect to you know, property or ability to make medical decisions, um, so here's gonna be the story. You're gonna have to find an, another way to make sure possibly um, giving someone the power to make healthcare decisions, giving a partner the power, although some hospitals aren't recognizing. So uh, there are some ways in the law possibly to leave property to someone, although there might be a question as to whether a will would be challenged on a claim of undue uh, influence. So there are a variety of difficulties that are presented because couples have to do things differently making it harder to protect possible real interests, meaning, you know, property interests of various sorts. And also we do have a background question of whether this is uh, communicating a kind of stigma um, for parentage, especially we just had a decision here in Ohio, right, that where it is alleged that one parent had given uh, her partner uh, parenting rights had said, yes, I want you to parent our children, et cetera, et cetera. And then later, the court refused to enforce, which made the person who'd been helping to raise the children a legal stranger to the children, which may well hurt the children as well as the partner. We have a separate issue where parenting is concerned, but that really is an important issue in a bunch of states where it's hard for same-sex couples because they can't marry 
to establish relations with the children whom they're raising. So in some states you can legally be recognized as the parents of both children if you're raising two kids, and some you can't. And if you can't, there are real difficulties if the relationship breaks down. Some of those difficulties involve the children maybe never getting able, never being able to see the parent who's been raising them for the past five, ten years. Those are important issues. Professor Dent. Uh, well, yeah, first of all, as, as far as uh, stigmatizing goes, again, uh, many gays and lesbians have said that their relationships are different and they want them to be, they, they want that to be acknowledged. Uh, in Massachusetts, for example, there were uh, many employers who were uh, giving uh, 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 benefits to uh, domestic partners of employees. When uh, Massachusetts uh, recognized same-sex marriage, uh, many of those employers said, well, okay, we're not, we're not going to give benefits to domestic partners anymore. If you want the benefits, get married. Uh, and many, uh, many of the, those people said, well, that's not really what we want to do. Uh, and uh, there was a uh, column uh, to the same effect in the New York Times a day or two after uh, the time, after the, uh, New York uh, recognized same-sex marriage. So this goes back to a point I made before, uh, whether we're going to take a one-size-fits-all uh, 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 approach uh, when uh, many gays and lesbians say that they don't want to be subject to the same rules. Uh, second, again, keep in mind here uh, that there are lots of uh, groups of adults uh, that would like to be treated as family uh, and would uh, have all the same issues uh, that you've asked. Again, uh, Kai Feldblum's uh, 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 group or home arrangement um, might want to be acknowledged as a family for purposes of certain property rights and such. Um, if legislatures want to deal with this, they can deal with these on an ad hoc basis. Uh, it doesn't seem to me to make any particular sense to take uh, one segment and, and stick it into uh, the uh, institution of marriage where it doesn't really fit very well and uh, leave others like uh, Professor Feldblum's arrangement uh, out in the woods altogether. Next question, please. Right here. Oh, uh, okay, Professor Strasser, welcome to KISS. And I want to ask you a question. First, I respect you, and I think you're a very kind man. But I can't agree about uh, what you said. Because I think, just like what Professor Dennis said, we should separate between same-sex love and same-sex marriage. They are different. Same-sex love is a citizen's fundamental right we should respect. But we cannot ac accept same-sex marriage because I think this is, there will be very uh, heavy relationship uh, between this and, and other things. This is just, uh, just like a flood, uh, flood uh, gate. Maybe same-sex marriage, whether this will be legalized. What about sodomy, incest, uh, sodomy, incest, and having sex with animals, and married with a dead body? For example, I love my little sister. He is my, she is my little sister-in-law. I, I want to marry with her. My claim is that this is my fundamental right. You said same-sex marriage, they can be couples. Why Sir, I can't do you have be a question? married with my... Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes, ask him a question, yeah. I just for example, so how can you solve my problem? Thank you. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, look, it is fair to say, um, I am arguing that same-sex marriage um, is protected. And, you know, I believe that there are important state interests which justify prohibiting incest, for example, especially when you have sort of uh, power differentials, you have actually various um, biological considerations um, that states have cited to justify why they're not going to allow, you know, parents to marry their kids. So um, I think the state can do it. I think the state has interests so you can rest assured, right? You don't have to worry about that. Um, as a by the way, traditionally, the way, our, the way our constitutional law has worked, we've protected family relationships over um, sort of one night stands over sexual relations. If following Lawrence, and it's unclear how to read Lawrence, if 
the right to engage in sexual relations is fundamental, then it would be an inverting of our traditional um, prioritization to say same-sex couples, yes, they can have sex, but that marriage stuff, the stuff that the state has really the interest in promoting, no, that's not a fundamental interest. As soon as, if you're giving same-sex relations as fundamental, I don't think it's going to be real hard to get same-sex relationships as fundamental and protected as well. Thanks. Professor Dent, would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, um, I'm, uh, I'm still, I, 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 uh, I'm still wondering about your answer, Professor Strauss, because I, I don't under understand. If two unrelated men can marry, why can't two brothers marry? Uh, you said a biological problem. I don't know what the biological problem would be there. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm still mystified. I'm also interested that you said traditionally we, we have uh, protected certain kinds of uh, relationships. Um, I'm glad to see you invoking tradition. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that I think makes a lot of sense. And I think that's a good reason for uh, adhering to traditional marriage. Next question, please. How about right here? Oh, this is for Professor Strauser. Uh, I was wondering if you think the government has the authority to define marriage in any way. And if you support gay marriage, is it somewhat inconsistent to not support polygamy? And if you're allowing some types of marriages and not others, isn't that opening the door to further discrimination? You know, and again, I think this is interesting, although I'm actually, I'd like to go back to what I was suggesting before. Um, the question at hand is whether a state limitation on marriage is promoting very important interests, right? So that's going to be the question. And I guess I'm more comfortable in protecting some interests, you know, with power differentials and incestuous. That's not polygamous, although traditionally in the polygamous relationships, what was happening is you would often have, uh, here anyway, a man who was marrying uh, more than one woman and she tended to be pretty young. I mean, and this was really one of the dangers that was going on in Utah. We're getting power differentials, we're getting a lot of worries. That said, I think each of the restrictions we have, sure, let's examine what the interests are, see if they're compelling and make a judgment in light thereof. So if there is no basis upon which to prevent polygamous marriage, okay, if there is a justification and at least the way it's been practiced, we have a lot of sort of taking advantage and coercion and non-voluntariness, if that's what's uh, justifying and that's enough, then, then fine. So the answer is more of let's look at the restrictions we have, see what interests are being promoted and whether those interests are sufficiently important. So I guess I don't see this as either a cascade. Um, it could mean we would change some rules. It might not. All I'm suggesting is let's examine and take seriously what the interests are and whether they're being promoted. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you got a good answer to your question. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, we, I, I think what the question Professor Strasser has suggested is the right question, but then he hasn't offered an answer to it, which is why is government concerned about marriage at all? Um, the traditional answer has been Again, Bertrand Russell's because of the because of the existence of children. Uh, Professor Strasser still no 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 that's that's not a good that's not a good justification. Uh, well, if it's not, what is? Uh, why should we privilege any particular relationship? Why shouldn't it be a, a, any relationship that adults want to create? Well, you know, what business is, is of government to say this relationship is good and that relationship is bad? Um, if we're not concerned about the, uh, responsible parenting, um, why would government be involved in this at all? So I think your, your question was an excellent one. Next question, please. Um, 
Okay, so the reason I find uh, Professor Strasser's answer to be uh, useful to me um, about you know why whether or not polygamous uh, relation or marriage should um, be protected is because um, this distinct scrutiny that the that the court uses to assess each specific situation um, has kept the courts from dealing with absolutes and uh, trampling rights whether or not they should be and um, been very useful in other circumstances. I mean, look at you know uh, gun control debates. You don't find you know states that are allowing people to buy you know rocket launchers and landmines than other states which are banning all sharp objects. So, in that sense, <laughs> if there's any there, um, why should um, this tool that the case, that the court has been using, this distinct scrutiny to each specific circumstances, whether or not um, there's a public good for each type of uh, marriage. Why should that not be used? And that's for uh, you, Professor Ben. Uh, I, I'm to clarify, or? Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> I'm, uh, 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 sc scrutiny for each type of marriage, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand the question. Uh, well, I meant um, in the sense that, uh, I mean, Professor Strasser has been saying that for each type of marriage, the court should be able to look at the specific circumstances and whether or not it would be beneficial for the society. Oh, yeah, okay, fine, but what's the answer? Well, I, I can't think of any. It's not I, the oh, again, if the, if the justification for marriage is not to encourage responsible parenting, what possible, I, I can't think of any other reason. It's, is, 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 is my short answer. Professor Strasser, perhaps you'd like to take um, it. Yeah, no, and you know, traditionally, uh, marriage promotes a bunch of interests. Marriage, um, people who have no interest in having a child, right, they don't want children or they can't have children and don't want children, so separate issues, those who want and might adopt. Marriage serves them too, and society is benefiting when individuals who are helping each other, they're getting things out. So marriage benefits adults, Certainly it benefits children, right? And insofar as we're getting these individuals benefited, society is benefiting. So marriage promotes a bunch of interests. My claim is Mary. All of those interests are promoted by recognizing same-sex marriage. But there are a whole host of interests. I would not support saying, to Mary you must have kids. No, that's because marriage serves other interests too. Another question? Um, how about right down here? Right, you. Maybe the other engineer left the building, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, my perception of, of what the role of the government, you ask about regulating marriage. I think that my perception, and this is more to clue me in, but the government's role has been to, is to regulate uh, relationships between humans when abuse is taking over, and that's when regulations seem to be brought in. You said what, uh, abuse? Yeah, when there's, in, there's one up, one down relationships, you have uh, corporations taking advantage of people, you have people taking advantage of others, so you bring in the government to regulate relationships when to, I guess, police them or make sure they're fair. I think we're of a government who's interested in fairness. Well, I'm, maybe I don't understand the question, but if anything, it sounds to me like you've got it backwards. If you look at uh, abuse in relationships, say, between uh, a, a man and a woman who are living together, you find that abuse is much more common in couples that are cohabiting than in couples that are married. So uh, again, maybe I, maybe I didn't understand the question. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the government, I mean, th it, it, the recognition of, of marriage helps to discourage abuse because of the traditions that are attached uh, attached to marriage. Well, I think that's exactly what I was speaking about. Sir, could you clarify your question, please? Just uh, the question. Could you clarify your question, please? You guys ask for a little more specificity <laughs> than I'm used to giving. But uh, there are abuses 
in there. I think in, in the sense of taking advantage of another person in either way. And it's, I think there are mechanisms when a, when a man abuses a woman in a relationship. There are mechanisms to deal with that. But we've changed in a lot of ways over your and my lifetime. Uh, gay relationships were not even discussed, at least in my neck of the woods. Sir, do you have a question that you'd like our speakers to answer, please? It, well, I can, yeah. uh, you know, again, I, I can only say that, uh, 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 to repeat, that, uh, that uh, actually uh, abuse is more common uh, where there is not marriage. So if anything, we would seek to uh, enhance uh, the prestige of marriage uh, and to uh, encourage marriage. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to me that, uh, again, uh, the American public has been very clear uh, that it does not think that recognition of same-sex marriage enhances uh, its respect for marriage. Um, there, when you think about marriage, marriage does a bunch of things, right? It can help individuals sort of plan together, they can rely more, they can invest in the relationship, which helps them, helps people uh, do better. It's also true the state has an interest when marriages break down. So I'm going to not talk about abuse in particular, because abuse can occur within and without. But it's true, one of the benefits of our marriage structure is when a relationship does break down, we have an organized way to divide up assets, possibly we'll order support or what to do with children. Our structure now is speaking both to the benefits that can be accrued during the marriage, but we really do have to consider what happens when things break down. And it's a benefit to society and the individuals themselves to have an organized way to structure all of this. That is another benefit we have of marriage. So when you're not thinking of abuse in particular, but a breakdown, the couple can't remain together, it's important for us to have a legal way to allow them to sort of exit and so people get sort of benefits and burdens together. And, and that's also part of what we do with marriage. I think that's right. We have time for one more question. Uh, do I have a student with a question? Uh, how about on this side here? Hi. Um, my question is, I guess, directed more at uh, Professor Strasser, but um, I was interested that you used um, gender as your basis um, as opposed to perhaps making homosexuality a protected class. And so I was just wondering um, why, I guess, you feel that way. Um, and so this is a good question, especially because um, the Obama administration has suggested that it believes orientation is a classification that should trigger heightened scrutiny. Now, it turns out under our jurisprudence, under the Constitution, if you discriminate on the basis of sex, you, get, you trigger closer scrutiny. Now, it, I think it's true that same-sex marriage bans are attempting to target on the basis of orientation. Maybe orientation should trigger as well, although it's true that you can um, offend the Equal Protection Clause in many ways. So um, I don't even think you have to choose. So one, I'm saying it's on the basis of sex because we have an established, already we have a system which says when you discriminate on the basis of sex, here's what happens. You don't even have to show who's hurt, who's helped. Here's what you do. Do I believe it is targeting orientation? Yes. Um, do I think in many cases it is um, arbitrary, capricious, possibly invidious, yes. Do I think that in addition you might subject to higher scrutiny? Sure, it would end up yielding the same result, but I, I admittedly was not choosing between them, but just fitting it within our established way of doing things. That would be another way that actually is going through the courts now, and we'll see how that goes. Professor Dent. Well, I I don't know if, I have, uh, if the question really uh, is, is addressed to me anyway, but uh, as far as uh, the gender issues, I mean, I guess it's pretty obvious that if uh, uh, marriage is concerned uh, with uh, encouraging responsible parenting, um, children are created by a woman and a man, 
uh, they are not created by two men or by two women, and uh, so that is the uh, that is the reason for uh, uh, for the uh, traditional definition of marriage. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now conclude with closing statements from both of our speakers. Professor Strasser, you have five minutes. Okay. Um, and so let me just make a, a couple points here. Um, first, if we are going to look to history and tradition, please consider one, although it may be that interracial marriage bans were unusual in various parts of the world, we had them here in this country since before the founding of the nation. Virginia had its ban since the 1600s. The first court to strike, where it, uh, to strike an interracial marriage ban, um, where, it, where it took, so to speak, was in 1948 in California, and Perez versus Lippold. We didn't have a lot of courts doing it. And further, we had a lot of states in the 50s, in the 60s, that had interracial marriage bans. Once there was a decision in 64, which struck down states um, punishing interracial non-marital relations more severely than intraracial relations, states started to repeal their statutes. But we had a whole host of states in the 60s precluding. If we're going to look at history and what people had in mind, the framers of the Civil War Amendments, sex is not going to be a protected classification. And you had members of Congress making jokes to each other about whether equal protection meant that there could be interracial marriage. It looks pretty clear that most members, the framers, many of the framers did not want to allow interracial marriage. Does that mean it shouldn't be allowed? No, it does suggest maybe that this tradition test is not such a good test. Marriage promotes a lot of interests. It promotes interests for the individuals, for their kids, for their more general families, for society. My point is merely those interests are promoted by recognizing, in addition, same-sex marriage. Is that saying get rid of traditional marriage? No, no, you want traditional marriage, that's fine. This is just expanding the pie. It's not getting rid of it all. Now, it's also true right now we have lots of cohabiting couples, different sex cohabiting couples. What should be done? Should benefits be afforded? Actually, you know, I think that's an interesting question, especially because we have so many couples raising kids who aren't married. So that is an important question, although all I'm suggesting here is that the state interests and the individual interests militate in favor of marriage. If you really think that marriage is for kids, although I think it's for a lot of things, but kids are among them, that's a reason to recognize, not to refuse to recognize. With respect to equal protection, there are a variety of bases. We could talk about classifying on the basis of sex, which should trigger higher scrutiny. Classifying on the basis of orientation, it's being argued now as to whether that should be triggering higher scrutiny. I also believe, though, we're not gaining anything, anything that is permissible by limiting marriage to different sex couples. We're losing things. We're hurting our kids. We're hurting adults, but we're not getting the benefits. This is not a legitimate way for us to um, create legislation. It's hurting society and it's hurting individuals. So I would suggest this is not r rationally related to a legitimate state interest, but I also believe whether we talk about a right to privacy, which protects marriage, that would be a reason state should, um, courts should look more closely, or whether we look at the classification on the basis of sex, targeting orientation, that would be a reason for courts to look more closely. It is my contention that it were a court to look more closely, it would never uphold same-sex marriage bans, and that's been the story when the states have been doing it. I also believe that even if they don't look closely and use a deferential review, we don't have real interest being promoted here. All we're doing is harming. That's not what we should be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Strasser. Professor Dent. 
we begin, I think, with the questions, um, what is the purpose of marriage, or what are the purposes of marriage, and uh, why and how should government uh, be involved in it? Um, I, I guess I should congratulate uh, Professor Strasser for, for being so uh, ambiguous. Uh, uh, which uh, is understandable given the nature of the campaign for same-sex marriage. On several, uh, uh, several of his statements, he's made it sound like he is a real champion of marriage. Marriage has so many benefits, so many, uh, confers so many benefits. At the same time, he has not said, no, definitely we should, uh, we should not uh, uh, give equal treatment to other arrangements, uh, polygamy and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and he said, well, maybe we should confer benefits on uh, cohabiting couples and so forth. Um, so we're really back to the question uh, that I've raised a couple of times. Is there anything special about marriage? And should government make any kind of, uh, ex uh, show any kind of preference for any kind of relationship among adults uh, as opposed to any other kind of relationship? Um, the, uh, I, I said that the campaign for same-sex marriage has been deceptive because it has talked about same-sex marriage, yet if you read the literature, many of the people who are arguing for it say this is simply a, a transitional uh, stage. This is simply a step. Uh, once we get this, then we will uh, move for uh, recognition of families we, we choose. Uh, Marianne Case at the uh, University of Chicago has said that um, domestic relations law should be like business law, which I teach. And you know, you've got several choices. You've got the corporation and the limited partnership and the LLC. She said, well, we should have that too for marriage too. You know, there should be group marriages and there should be domestic partnerships and people could choose whatever they want. In other words, there's nothing special about marriage that we ought to encourage. So I think that's really the question, the question we're dealing with. Well, I think there is something special about marriage that should be encouraged and it does relate to the important function, the crucial function, of encouraging responsible parenting. Again, by every measure, children raised by their married biolog biological parents uh, are much better off uh, than other children. Uh, Professor Strasser made, a, again, a, a, a small a reference uh, to uh, the children of, uh, being raised by same-sex couples doing just fine. Uh, wh what does that mean? Uh, actually, uh, the uh, studies of, of children raised by same-sex couples in most cases have uh, begun with uh, married women who got divorced and then some entered into a lesbian relationship and some stayed single. And the studies have said that after a short period of time, the children uh, living with the same-sex couple were doing as well as the uh, children living with the uh, um, mother, uh, alone with the mother. Uh, yeah, um, surprise, surprise. Uh, you know, one broken family is doing as well as another broken family. Uh, when uh, in the Perry uh, uh, trial, uh, a, uh, an expert for uh, the defendants uh, was asked uh, if, um, uh, for the plaintiffs was asked, uh, have any of these studies of children being raised by same-sex couples been normed against children being raised by their married biological parents? The expert said, no, I don't know of a single one. And in fact, there isn't a single one. Uh, so, the traditional marriage is something special. Uh, we should not abandon marriage. We should not recognize any group that wants to call itself a family. Uh, every society has recognized marriage and it's always been between a man and a woman. That is because it has served important social functions uh, and I think we should uh, preserve that here as well. Thank you. Once again, thank you to both professors.
and gentlemen, we would like to take a moment to thank our contributors. Please hold your applause until the end. Um, please join me in extending special thanks to the Office of the President and Provost, the Office of Government Relations and Community Affairs, the School of Law, the Center for Policy Studies, the Cleveland Institute of Art, the Federalist Society for providing the constitutions today, the speakers, the panelists, and the Constitution Day Student Committee. At this time, you're all invited to proceed upstairs to Blackacre Cafeteria, where a light dinner will be served. Thank you very much.